Bifocal, Chapter 21, Haroon We leave right after school, crammed into Miss Singh's rusty old blue Dodge Shadow. There's a rehearsal, so we can all get used to using the buzzers, then a dinner break. The show provides sandwiches, but Miss Singh says it's too soon to get cozy with the enemy. She means the team from Rutherford High in the next county. So she takes us out for Chinese food. She keeps us laughing with tales of all the things that have gone wrong on her travels. She and her friend Ruth, an Israeli teacher who lives in Jerusalem, only get to see each other on school breaks, and they always meet up in some place like Lourdes or Busan or Ayers Rock with their backpacks and their hitchhiking thumbs. When you travel like that, things always go wrong, although often in a good way. We laugh so much that our nerves go away, and we are able to get enough protein and carbohydrates into us to keep us going through the competition. I've never been in a television studio, and even though this is a local public television, not Rockefeller Center, it's still exciting. I'm almost too excited to be nervous. People are rushing around, looking like they have important things to do and know how to do them. I've visited my mother at her work many times, and have seen that same look of important busyness in people who work around the hospital. The difference, of course, is that at the hospital, work is life and death. At a television studio, the stakes are not nearly as high. Miss Singh says it's only a quiz show. They put makeup on all of us, even the guys. You'll look like the undead if you go under those TV lights without a bit of color, the makeup artist says. She has a thick Yorkshire accent. And that may be fine for Halloween tonight, but the show won't air for another week, she adds, dabbing rouge and other stuff on my face. Women do this every day, I say marveling at the hassle. Oh, sure, some ladies don't go anywhere without their makeup and masks on. I'm sitting with the rest of my team on the stage, which is called The Floor. All black with tape marks show where the folks are supposed to stand. There's a great deal of worry among the technicians that we don't trip on cords. The cords are covered over, but they tell us numerous times to be careful anyways. I guess they're used to dealing with adolescents who have more growth than grace. My family is in the audience, front row. Zana is getting some looks and whispers from people in the audience. If she knows, she doesn't show it. My parents know, though. My mother puts her hand on Zana's arm. My father leans in with a big smile to, as to tell her a joke he's probably told her a hundred times before. The three of them laugh. I love that about my family. We fight, but we stick together. Zana is far from the strangest-looking person in the audience. I'd say that award would have to go to the girl two rows back, hair in orange spikes and white powder on her skin, making the heavy black eye makeup and lipstick stand out. Her parents are leaning away from her. I have a quirky desire to get her and Zana together. They're both independent. I bet they'd like each other. They're dressing alike to intimidate us, Nadia says, nodding towards the Rutherford team. They're not a uniform school, but tonight they're all wearing black turtlenecks. They look like beatniks, Nadia says. Somebody passed them some bongos and espresso. My face feels funny. I start to think about all the women in the audience with makeup on their faces, but my thoughts are interrupted by a production assistant. She hands me a 3 by 5 card and a pen. Write down something interesting about yourself, she tells us. When Betty introduces you, you'll want her to have something to say, right? Now's the chance to impress your friends, tell your secrets, confess your sins. One or two lines will do. Print legibly. I know about this from previous shows, and Miss Singh has reminded us to be thinking of something to write, but I'd put it out of my mind. What's interesting about me? I have a very smart sister, a mother who's a doctor, and a father who's a professor. They are interesting. The only interesting thing about me is that I'm on the reach for the top team, and I can't very well put that down. The Rutherford team is writing, scratching out, snorting, and pushing each other. They ask for more cards. My own team is more refined. I can see they've all got something written. I lean in, thinking I can steal an idea, but then I think of something on my own. It's daring, but it feels right, and I don't hesitate. The cards are collected, and someone comes to, out to talk to the audience, explain the rules, and rev them up. Then we're told to take our places. The lights are bright in my eyes. I can hardly see the audience, but I can sense they're there. Feet shuffling, someone coughs. I put all other thoughts out of my mind. Pretend you're back in my classroom, Miss Singh has advised us. Rely on your brains. You've trained them well. I take a very deep breath. I've trained. I'm ready. We all are.
The director cues, the camera lights up, the announcer booms. It's time to play Reach for the Top, Game 1 of the Regional Championships. It's Rutherford High versus Central Secondary. Please welcome your host, Betty Olson. All energy and enthusiasm, Betty bounds onto the stage. She's a younger version of Miss Singh, although Miss Singh doesn't need to look at the answers. Within moments, we are into the game. First round, snappers, for ten points each. Questions are snapped out and answers are tossed back just as quickly. Elemental symbol for polonium, P.O. Metric equivalent of the pennyweight, 1.555 grams. Latin word for 13, tradesium. On it goes. Our teams are evenly matched. Rutherford makes early gains out of the gate, but then they get overconfident and start to fumble. We close the gap. After a couple of rounds of questions, Betty stands between the two teams. Now let's meet the team, she says. In her hands are the three-by-five cards we filled out. The Rutherford team goes first. Its members, interesting points, vary from a love of mustard to a hobby of developing a database on all the kings and queens in history. Then it's our turn. The other three go first. I'm the most recent member of the team, so I'm at the far end. And this is Haroon, Betty says, still beaming and energetic. She has no idea of what the words on the card she's holding on to are going to mean to some people. Haroon, you have someone you'd like to say a special hello to. Yes, I say, plunging in quickly so I can't chicken out. I'd like to say hello to Azim. He was originally part of the team but had to drop out. I'd like to say hi and thanks for the coaching. Betty turns to the camera and smiles. Azim, if you're watching, a big hello from all of us. Now on to the theme round. I can see Miss Singh. She gives me a thumbs up. I can't see my parents because of the bright lights, but I like to think that they're proud that I did that. For all their worrying, they value kindness above security. Anyway, I'm proud of what I did. We are halfway through the theme round, four questions on a common theme, in this case, Royal Rascals. When the director calls halt, we need everyone to leave the studio immediately, she says. I see two police officers come onto the floor. Everyone, please step outside. The staff will guide you out. My brain is still in quiz mode, so is the host. She goes over to the director and starts to argue. The director says something quietly to her. Then Betty is back to us, shooing us out, telling us to hurry and to watch out for the cords. We are taken outside to the parking lot. I join my family. Please, everybody stay together. I'm sure it's nothing and we'll be back inside in a moment. What's happening? I hear my parents ask. Is there a fire? Fire trucks are already there. Another one arrives as we gather. A bomb threat was phoned into the studio, the director says, trying with the tone of her voice to make it sound like it was no big deal. Probably just a kid doing a Halloween prank. The police will check out the building, then we'll go back in and finish the show. Just a kid, I think, and it's on the tip of my tongue to say which one. I leave my family and go over to Miss Singh. She knows what I'm thinking before I say anything. There is no proof, she says. He threatened us, I say quietly. There's no proof, she says again. Do you want to live in a country where people can be accused without proof? This is out of our hands. Keep your head in the game, stand with your teammates, and pretend you're still in the studio. It's silly advice, but strangely it works. Rutherford High is bouncing around, its members scattered to family and school friends. We stand together, keeping our thoughts still. It makes a difference when we're given the all-clear soon after and are allowed to go back into the studio. It doesn't take long for the machinery of the show to crank back into place. I take my spot behind my buzzer, endure the makeup woman dabbing stuff on my face, and we're ready to roll. We start with another theme round. Our score's even. Rutherford is having trouble getting their concentration back. Their answers to the tall tales questions are all over the place. Our score takes a great leap forward. We get a moment to catch our breath when Betty gives everyone the rundown on the prizes and introduces the judges. Are you all right? Nijin asks me. What? Of course, I say. You look angry. I am, I say. But I'm also all right. I don't know for sure who called in the bomb threat. There are people everywhere who like to play stupid pranks, although playing one on the local public television station isn't likely to be an obvious choice. I know I can't be certain it was Hattie, but the fact that it could be is enough to make me furious. I've had enough. From the harassment of Xana, to being thought of as an informer, to messing up of Brown Town, I've had it with ignorance. It's one thing to be uninformed. It's another thing to choose to be stupid. 
I am so angry I ride that buzzer like a flying machine. I answer the questions before they're even out of the host's mouth. I answer questions about things I don't even know. I rule that show. My teammates back me up, but mostly they just clear the field and let me go. We obliterate Rutherford. We do it with our minds, and when the show is over, we shake their hands, show them respect, and let them go on their way. Why can't all battles be like this?